The Tiger of Mysore by G. A. Henty. Chapter Fifteen. Escape. Annie Mansfield was not long before she mastered her emotions. She had learned to do so in a bitter school. Beaten for the slightest fault, or at the mere caprice of one of her many mistresses, she had learned to suffer pain without a tear, to assume a submissive attitude under the greatest provocation, to receive, without attempting to defend herself, punishment for faults she had not committed, and to preserve an appearance of cheerfulness when her heart seemed breaking at the hopelessness of any deliverance from her fate. For the last six months she had been specially unhappy, for when Seringapatam had been besieged, she had hoped that when it was captured her countrymen would search the palace, and see that this time no English captive remained behind. Her disappointment, then, when she heard that peace had been made, and that the English army was to march away without even an attempt to see that the condition for the release of captives was faithfully carried out, had for a time completely crushed her, and all hope had forsaken her. Thus, then, while she had been for a moment overwhelmed at finding that her preserver from the tiger was a countryman in disguise, and that he was willing to make an attempt to rescue her, yet in a few minutes she stifled her sobs, hastily thrust back the hair that had fallen over her face, uncoiled herself from her crouching position in the angle of the divan, and rose to her feet. "'I can hardly believe it to be true,' she said in a low voice. "'Oh, Sahib, do you really mean what you say?' And are you willing to run the risk of taking me away with you? Of course I am, Dick said heartily. You don't suppose that an Englishman would be so base as to leave a young countrywoman in the hands of these wretches? I do not think that there is much risk in it. Of course, you will have to disguise yourself, and there may be some hardships to go through, but once away from here we are not likely to be interfered with. You see, my friend and I are officers of the palace, and no one would venture to question us as we should be supposed to be travelling upon the Sultan's business. There is peace at present, and although Tippu may intend some day or other to fight again, everything is settling down quietly. Traders go about the country unquestioned. There is plenty of traffic on the roads from one town to another, and so long as your disguise is good enough to prevent you from being recognized as a white, there is no great danger in travelling in Mysore than there would be down in Karnatik. Annie stood before him with her fingers playing nervously with each other, long trained in habits of implicit obedience, and to stand in an attitude of deep respect before her numerous mistresses. She was in ignorance whether she ought to speak or not. She had been but a child of six when she had been carried off. Her remembrance of English manners had quite died out, and the habit of silent submission had become habitual to her. Dick was puzzled by her silence. "'Of course, Annie,' he said at last, "'I don't want you to go with me if you would rather stay here, "'or if you are afraid of the risk of travelling." She looked up with frightened eyes. "'Oh, Sahib, it, it's not that. I would go even if I felt sure I should be found out and cut to pieces. Anything would be better than this. I, I am not afraid at all, but forgive me, Sahib. I don't know how to thank you. I don't know what is proper to say. It's all so strange and so wonderful.' Oh, it's all right, Annie, Dick said cheerfully. Of course, you'll feel it a little strange just at starting. Well, in the first place, you must call me Dick instead of calling me Sahib. And in the next place, you must talk to me freely as a friend, and not stand as if I were your master. While we are on this journey together, consider me as sort of a big brother. When we get down to the Ghats, I'll hand you over to the care of my mother, who is living at present at Tripatli with her brother, the Rajah. Now sit down again, and let us make our arrangements. When we have done that, we can talk, if there's time. Now, how am I to let you know if I have to go away suddenly? Do you always get out at this time of a morning? No, not always, but very often. I always go down at twelve o'clock with some of the other slave girls to fetch the food and sweetmeats for the ladies of the harem. Well, you must always manage, even if you are not set out, to look out through that doorway where you met me at eight o'clock in the morning. If we have anything particular to say to you, Surajah, that's my friend, you know, will be there. Which way do you go out from the harem to fetch the food? Not from that door, but from the one nearest to the kitchen. You go right down that corridor, and then take the first turning to the right. There's a flight of stairs at its end. We come out at that door, just at its head. At the foot of the stairs there's a long passage, and at the end of that is a large room with tables, 
on which the dishes are placed in readiness for us to bring back. Well, if it's necessary to speak to you at once, one of us will meet you in the passage between the bottom of the stairs and the room where the food is. If you see one of us, you will know that the matter is urgent, and as soon as you can possibly slip away, you must come here. In the evening you had better again look out from the door where you first met me. Now, as to the disguise, it will be better for you to go as a boy. It would be strange to see a girl riding between two of the officers of the palace. You won't mind that, will you? Oh, not at all, Sahib. Not at all, Dick, he corrected. Well, I will have a dress ready for you here. You'll find it in that corner, and there will be a bottle of stain on the table. It will be only necessary for you to color your neck, hands, and feet, but you must cut off your hair behind to a level with your ears, so that none of it will show below the turban. You must do that, of course, before you stain your neck, and must stain the skin where you have cut off your hair also. I'm giving you these instructions now, because when the time comes there may not be a minute to spare, though, of course, I hope there will be no desperate hurry. Oh, I understand, she said, and will look out for you three times a day. Of course, he went on, if you are suddenly told that you are to be given to anyone, you must slip out at once and come here. You'll find everything ready for you to disguise yourself, and you must do that at once and wait here till one of us comes. Even if you are missed, it will be some time before any search is made, and it would be thought much more likely that you had gone down into the town than that you were hiding in the palace so there would be no chance of their looking for you here before we return. Anyhow, we shall be able to have another talk before Tippu comes back. We shall be here every morning until nine, and if you are able to get away again, come and see us. It will be better, perhaps, for you not to wait any longer now. I suppose you have been charged with some message or other, and it would not do for you to be too long gone. The girl stood up at once. I have to go down to the peta to get some sewing silk to match this and she drew out a small fragment of yellow silk. "'Very well, then. You had better go and do it, or they may think that you are too long away. Good-bye, Annie. I hope that in another week or ten days at the latest I shall have you out of this.' And he held out his hand to her. She took it timidly and would have raised it to her forehead, but Dick said, laughing, "'That is not the way, Annie. English girls don't treat their friends as if they were lords and masters. They just shake hands with them as if it were two men or two girls.' "'I shall know better in time,' she said with a faint smile, though her eyes were full of tears. "'I want to do something, though I don't know what. You saved my life from the tiger, and now you're going to save me again. I'd like to throw myself down and kiss your feet.' "'You'd make me horribly uncomfortable if you did anything of that sort, Annie. I can understand that you feel strange and out of your element at present, but you'll soon get over that when you come to know me better. There, good-bye, lassie.' I hope to see you again tomorrow or next day, and then you'll be able to tell me more about yourself. Is the coast clear, Surajah? Surajah looked out through the curtains. There is no one in sight, he said a moment later. The girl passed silently out and went down the corridor. Surajah returned from his post by the door. The poor girl is shy and awkward as yet, Dick said, but I think she'll be plucky enough when the time comes. You heard what we said, the first thing will be to get her disguise ready for her. What do you think? Had we better take Ibrahim with us? I think he is to be trusted. Oh, I'm sure he is, Surajah agreed. He's a Hindu of Korg, and was carried away as a slave six years ago. In the first place he will be delighted at the prospect of getting away, and in the next I am sure that he is very fond of you. But there is no occasion to tell him that you are English. No, it will be time enough to do that when we get over the ghats. It will be better that he should get the disguise. In the first place he will know exactly what is wanted, and in the next it would look rum for either of us to be buying such a thing. Of course we could ask Petrov to get it for us, but if we take Ibrahim with us he may as well buy it. We shall want a couple of more horses. These, of course, we can buy ourselves, and saddles and things. When we have got them we had better leave them at some place on the other side of the river. Petrov would help us there. He's sure to know someone who will look after them for a few days. Then Ibrahim and the girl can start together, go over there and saddle them, so as to be in readiness to mount directly we come along. We'll stop at the wood and dig up the caskets. There's nothing like taking them away with us when there's a chance, and it's not likely that we shall come back to Seringapatam again. It would be like putting our heads in a tiger's den. When Ibrahim brought in the dishes for their meal, Dick said, 
Go down and get your own food, Ibrahim, and when you have done, come back here again. I want to have a talk with you. They had just finished their meal when Ibrahim returned. Ibrahim, would you be glad of a chance of getting away from here and returning to your own country? Oh, I would have given anything to do so, my lord, Ibrahim said, before I was ordered to attend upon you. But I am happy now. You are kind to me, and I should not like to leave your service. But if I were going too, Ibrahim, then, my lord, I would go with you anywhere if you would take me. Well, Ibrahim, we feel sure that we can trust you, and so I may tell you that I think it likely we shall very shortly go away. You know what the Sultan is. One day he gives you honors and rewards, the next he disgraces you, and perhaps sends you into the ranks of the army, perhaps has you thrown to the tigers. We do not care to live under such conditions, and we mean in a few days to slip away and go to our friends down the ghats. You can come with us, if you like. I would go with you to the end of the world, my lord, Ibrahim exclaimed earnestly. To go with you and be a free man and not a slave would be almost too great happiness. Well, then, that's settled. Now, Ibrahim, we are not going alone. We are going to take with us a young white slave in the harem and restore her to her friends. I want you to get a disguise for her. Let it be a dress like your own, long white trousers to the ankle, a shirt and tunic with waist belt, also the stuff for a turban. That you must wind in proper folds, as she would not be able to do it herself. I also want a bottle of stain for the skin. I will get them, my lord. How tall is she? About half a head shorter than you are. She's about the size of an average Hindu woman. Shall I get the things at once, my lord? Yes, you had better get them to-day. You may leave at any time, and it's as well to have them in readiness. We shall buy two horses, one for each of you and have them taken across the river. You can ride, I suppose. Oh, yes, I used to ride when I was a boy, before Tippu came down and killed my father and mother and brought me up here. Well, my lord, want me to take the horses across? I will tell you that in the morning, Ibrahim. We are going down into the town now to inquire about them, but we shall not buy any until to-morrow, as we shall have to make arrangements for them to be kept for us until we want them. They did not go out until it was dark, and then took their way to Petrov's house. The old Hindu was in. "'I am glad to see you, Sahibs,' he said to Dick, as they entered. "'I have always fears that ill may in some way befall you.' "'We are going to leave, Petrov. Surajah had two days ago to go up to see four English prisoners put to death at one of the hill-forts. Next time I may be ordered on such a duty. I could not carry it out, and you know that refusal would probably mean death.' Moreover, we're convinced that we have no means here of finding out what captives may still be in Tippoo's hands, and have therefore determined to leave. We're going to take with us our servant, Ibrahim, who is a slave from Kurg, and will, we know, be faithful to us, and also a young English girl who has, for the last eight years, been a slave in Tippoo's harem. She will go with us in the disguise of a boy. This Ibrahim is getting for us. We are going to buy a couple of horses for them, and we shall make straight down the ghats where I shall leave the girl in my mother's care. "'It is a good action,' the Hindu said gravely. "'Now, in the first place, Pertab, would you like to go with us? Riding, as we shall do, as two of the officers of the palace, it's not likely that any questions whatever will be asked, and certainly we shall have no difficulty until it comes to crossing the frontier. "'No, Sahib, I thank you, but I am too old now for any fresh change.' I have friends here, and have none below the ghats. Nothing save the rescue of my daughter from the harem would induce me to move now, and of that there is little chance. She will by this time have become reconciled to her fate, and would probably not care to escape were an opportunity offered to her. Besides, with only me to protect her, what would she do elsewhere? A few months, and she might be left alone in the world. As to that, Dick said, I could promise her the protection of my aunt, the wife of the Raja of Tripatli. After the kindness that you have shown to us, she would, I am sure, gladly take her into her service, and there will be no difficulty about a dowry for her. I would see to that. The old man shook his head. There could be no question of marriage, he said. But should I ever hear from her that she is unhappy, and I can arrange to fly with her, I will assuredly avail myself of your offer, and take her to tri Tripatli. Rejoiced indeed that at my death, there will be a shelter open to her. And now, can I aid you in any way, Sahib? One of my friends, a merchant, could get the horses for you without difficulty, 
he has often occasion to buy them for purposes of his trade. Thank you, Pertraub. I had intended to buy them myself, but doubtless it will be safer for somebody else to do so. What I was going to ask you was to let me know of some place on the other side of the river, where the horses could be kept until I wanted them. That I can do, Sahib. I have a friend, a cultivator. His house stands by itself on this side of the first village, the one half a mile beyond the fort. It's the only house this side of the village, so you cannot mistake it. It lies about a hundred yards back from the road. I will go over and arrange with him that, when two horses arrive, they shall be placed in his stalls, and remain there until one arrives who will say to him, after greeting, the word Madras. To him he is to deliver the horses at once, whether he comes by night or day. That would do admirably, Pertrobe. Of course I shall also want saddles and bridles. How much do you think it will come to altogether? I do not want showy horses, but they must be animals capable of performing a long journey, and of travelling at a fair rate of speed, the faster the better. We are likely to get seven or eight hours' start, at least, but must, of course, travel fast. As long as all goes well I shall keep to the main roads, but if there is a breakdown or an unforeseen accident occurs, I may have to leave the road and take to by-paths. The cost of such horses would be about eighty rupees each, the saddles and bridles another fifteen or twenty. Then here are two hundred rupees, Bertrab. Have you given up all hope of finding your father, Sahib? I have felt so sure that you would be successful. It seems to me that such brave efforts could not go unrewarded. No, Pertraub, I have not given it up at all. I intend to stay at Tripatli for a fortnight with my mother, and then shall come back up the ghats again. Uh, that is another matter I want to speak to you about. Of course we should not dare to return to Seringapatam, and I think we had better settle to go to Bangalore. Could you forward our packs with the merchandise to someone in that town? Oh, there will be no difficulty in that, Sahib. There are many Hindu merchants there, who have been forced to change their religion, and who have frequent dealings with traders here. One of my friends will, I am sure, forward your goods with the next consignment that he sends to Bangalore. That also I will arrange to-morrow, and when you come in the evening will give you the name of the trader there, together with a letter from the one here, telling him that you are the person to whom the goods are to be given up. Thank you, Petrob. I don't know what we should have done without your assistance. It's been a pleasure to me to be of use to you, Sahib. I had thought my time of usefulness was over, and it has given a real pleasure to my life to have been able to aid you. You will let me know, Sahib, if ever you find your father? Certainly, Petrob, I will, in any case, send word to you, either that I have found him or that I have given up all hope and have abandoned my efforts. The next morning a lad brought Dick a message from Pertraub that he had fulfilled all his commissions, and on the following morning Annie Mansfield again came to Dick's room. "'Everything is going on well, Annie,' Dick said as he shook hands with her. "'The horses have been bought. There is your disguise in that corner, and we can start any moment at a quarter of an hour's notice. Now I want you to tell me how you came to be brought here.' "'Oh, I have not much to tell,' she said. "'You see, I was only six years old. I can remember there was a great deal of firing of guns, and that lasted for a long time. Then the firing stopped. I suppose the place surrendered. Do you know what place it was, Annie? She shook her head. I do not know at all. I suppose I did know then, but I do not remember ever to have heard the name. I remember quite well that there were soldiers, and father and mother and servants and many other people, and everyone was very miserable, and we all went together out of a gate and on each side there were a great many natives with guns and swords, some on horse and some on foot, and there were elephants. I don't think I had ever seen one before, for I noticed them particularly. We went on and on, and I know one of the soldiers carried me. At night we stopped somewhere, I think it was in a wood, and there were fires, and we lay down to sleep on the ground. Then I woke up suddenly, and there was a great noise and firing of guns, and someone caught me up and threw something over my head, and... I don't remember anything more for a long time. I know that presently I was on horseback before a fierce-looking man. There were a good many of them, and when I cried for my father and mother, they said they would cut off my head if I were not quiet. I do not know how long we were traveling, but after the first day there was only the man who carried me and another. I was brought here, and there were many people, and I was very much frightened. Then I found myself only among women, and they took off my clothes and dressed me in their fashion. I think I was very happy when I once got accustomed to it. 
The ladies made a sort of pet of me, and I was taught to dance and to sing little native songs. There were other white girls here, and they were all very kind to me, though they always seemed very sad, and I could not make out why they cried so often, especially when they were beaten for crying. As I grew bigger I was not so happy. I had ceased to be a plaything, and little by little I was set to work to sweep and dust, and then to sew, and then to do all sorts of work like the other slave girls. The other white girls gradually went away, the oldest first. The last two, who were two or three years older than I was, went about three years ago. At first I used to wonder why they cried so when they went, and why the others all cried too, but by the time the last two left I had come to know all about it, and knew that they had been given by the Sultan to his favorite officers. There were many white men here when I first came. When I went out with one of the slaves into the town I saw them often. Sometimes they would burst into tears when they saw me. Then I used to wonder why, but I know now that I must have reminded them of girls of their own, whom they would never see again. Then till three years ago there were about twenty white boys who had been taught to dance and sing, and who used to come sometimes dressed up like women to amuse the ladies of the harem. But I heard that they were all killed, when the Sultan first thought that the English might come here. One of the slave girls told me that it was done because the Sultan had often sworn to the English that there were no white captives here, and so he did not wish that any should be found if they came. I don't think that I have anything else to tell you. Well, I hope that when you have told me will be enough to enable us some day to find out who you belong to. Evidently you were in some place that was besieged eight years ago, and had to surrender. The garrison were promised their lives and liberty to depart. They were attacked at night by an armed party, who may have been Hyder's horsemen, but who were perhaps merely a party of mounted robbers, who thought that they might be able to take some loot. Most likely they were defeated, especially as you saw no other captives in the party, but in the confusion of the night attack one of them probably came upon you and carried you off, thinking you would be an acceptable present here, and that he would get a reward for you from the Sultan. Are you not noticed when you go into the streets on errands? No, I always go veiled, except the slaves who are old and ugly. All the others wear veils when they go outside the palace, and we all wear a red scarf which shows we are servants in the harem, and so even when the town is full of rough soldiers no one ventures to speak to us. Now tell me, Dick, you see I have not forgotten, all about how you came to be here. Dick told her briefly how he had come out with his mother, and how finding war had broken out had joined the army and how at the end of the war, having been able to learn nothing about his father, he had come up with Surajah to search for him. And then you saw that tiger break in, the girl said eagerly. That was dreadful. I will tell you how it was the tiger came to seize me. I was standing behind a lady and could not see anything. Suddenly they all began screaming and ran, some to one side, some to the other of the window. And I, who could not think what was the matter, remained where I was, when there was a great cry, and before I had time to move, or even to wonder, some great thing knocked me down. It was only from the screams of the ladies and their cries of tiger that I knew what had happened. I felt something heavy standing on me, so heavy that I could hardly breathe, and indeed I did not try to breathe, for I knew many stories of tigers, and had heard that sometimes when a man shams being dead, the tiger will walk away and kill someone else. The tiger was keeping up an angry growl, and I felt that unless it took its paw off me, I should soon die, when I heard a shot and a fierce growl from the tiger, and then the weight was gone, and I think I fainted. When I came round I was lying where I fell, for many of the ladies were insensible, and every one was too busy with them to think of anything about me. When I got up, and one of the other slave girls, who had been brave enough to look out the window, told me that the tiger had been killed by two young men one of whom must have been the one who had fired the shot in at the window. I went and looked out and saw it lying there, and after that everyone talked and laughed and cried, and then the Sultan's chief wife said that everyone must make a present to the young men who had saved us, and that each one ought to give one of her best jewels. Of course everyone did. I had nothing to give except a little cross of gold filigree work that hung round my neck when I was carried off. It had been hidden by my dress. The men had not noticed it, and they had not taken it away when I was brought here. It was such a poor little gift, but it was really all I had. I noticed it, Annie, Dick said. There was a 
little flat plate behind it with the letters A. M., and I thought then that it must be some little ornament taken from one of the English women Hyder's troops had killed. It's fortunate you kept it, for it may be useful some day in proving that you are Annie Mansfield. Now I must be going, she said. I was slapped and pinched last time for being so long, but I have several things to get today, so that if I hurry I can be back again as soon as they expect me. You have not settled when you are going yet? No, but we rather think of going the day after tomorrow. It will be better to do so before Tippoo comes back, for we might be ordered away so quickly as to have no time to make arrangements. Besides, there will be ten times as many people about in the palace, and more guards at the entrances when he returns. So altogether it will be better to go before he does so. If we settle it so, I will come along past your door tomorrow evening. And if I say, "'Tomorrow morning, get here as soon as you can in the morning, and directly you have stained your skin and put on your disguise, we will start. My servant who is going with us will act as your guide, and will take you to the place where the horses are, and where we shall join you, almost as soon as you get there. At the appointed time, next evening, Dick told Annie that they should start in the morning. He and Surajah then went down and said good-bye to Pertaub, and Dick gave him a letter to his aunt to give to her should he ever go to Tripatli with his daughter. It may be, he said, that neither Surajah nor I may be there, but I shall speak to her about you, and of course tell her how much you have done for us, so you may be sure of the heartiest welcome from her. "'And you will also find a hearty friend in my father, Raj Bulub, Surajah said. "'He is principal officer in the Rajah's household, and will treat you as a brother, and your daughter as if she were my sister.' Then they returned to the palace, where they had a final talk over the route that they would best to pursue. The nearest point to the new frontier was the territory ceded to the English on the Malabar coast. But this would entail a long sea voyage, and they therefore determined to make for Kavrapatam, going by the road that led through Anakol and then through Ryakata, which stood just outside the line of territory ceded to England, and from whence a road led directly down the passes. Anakol lay nearly due south of Bangalore, but the road they would follow would not be the one by which Tipu would return, as he would come by the main road which ran in a direct line between the two cities. Ibrahim was informed of their plans, and was told to warn the Sais to get their horses saddled and in readiness at eight o'clock, and that, as they were going for a long day's ride, he would not be required to accompany them, as he always did when they rode only into the town, for then he might be wanted to hold the horses if they dismounted and went into a shop. He was also to give notice in the kitchen that they would not return to the midday meal, and that dishes for them would therefore not be required. Thus it would be unlikely that any suspicion would be aroused by their absence until they had been gone for twenty-four hours, by which time they would be more than half-way to the frontier. They went to bed at their usual time and slept soundly, for it seemed to them both that there was practically no risk whatever to be run, and that they would be across the frontier before any active search was made for them. Even when it was discovered that they had left the palace, it would be thought that they had received some order from Bangalore either to join the Sultan or to go on some mission for him that had occupied more time than they had anticipated on starting. The idea that two officers who were considered to stand high in Tipu's favor should desert would scarcely occur to anyone. In the morning they were up early, completed their slight preparations, and took their early breakfast, reserving a portion for Annie, who they thought would not improbably have eaten nothing before coming to them. She was a quarter of an hour late in arriving, and looked somewhat pale and flurried. "'They did not send me out this morning,' she said, "'and so I had to stay until I could slip out without being noticed. But they may miss me at any moment.' "'That will be all right,' Dick said confidently. "'They'll search all the rooms in the harem for you first, and certainly won't look for you outside, until there's been a lot of talk over your absence. But even if they do search, you'll be able in a few minutes to walk through the middle of them without being suspected.' However, we'll lose no time, and to begin with, I'll cut off what hair is necessary. I shall do it a good deal quicker than you would. Then we will leave you to yourself to stain your skin and put on your disguise. When you have finished, clap your hands. Ibrahim will come in and see that your disguise is all right, and that your turban covers your hair. Then he will go with you. We shall be waiting near the gate. There is practically no chance of your being asked any questions, but if you are, and there is any difficulty, we will pass you through all right. Having seen you on your way, 
we shall mount and follow you. The operation of cutting off Annie's hair to the line of her ears was speedily done. Then, with a few reassuring words, Dick joined Surajah in the corridor. As they walked down it, he said, "'I don't like leaving them to themselves. Look here, Surajah. You go down to the stable and mount at once. Tell the Syce I shall come for my horse in a few minutes. Then ride out and take your post where you can see them come out of the gate, and then follow them closely. I will stay here and see them safely through the gate, and then mount and follow you. I shall overtake you before you get to the ford. That will perhaps be safest, Surajah agreed, though I should think there is no chance of her being suspected, seeing that she will be with Ibrahim. Even if they met one of the palace officers, and he asked Ibrahim who he had with him, Ibrahim could say it was a lad who had come to you, respecting some horses you had bought. Yes, that would do very well. Dick returned to Ibrahim, who was squatting down in the corridor near the door. I'm going to follow you until you are through the gate, and shall keep a short distance behind you. If you should meet any officer on your way out, who may ask you who you have with you, say he has come with a message to me from a traitor in the town. By the time you have told him that, I shall be up. There is no chance of being questioned, my lord. People come and go all day. That is so, Ibrahim, but one cannot be too careful. They stood talking together until they heard Annie clap her hands within. Ibrahim entered at once, and in two or three minutes came out again with the girl. Ibrahim carried a bundle. "'You will do very well,' Dick said to Annie. "'I should not know you in the least. You make a capital boy.' "'What bundle is that, Ibrahim? I thought you took out our other disguises on yesterday, to the stable where the horses are.' "'Yes, my lord, I took them on. These are the things she has taken off. I thought perhaps it would be better not to leave them here, as if they were found it would be known that she had gone with you.' "'I don't think it makes much difference, Ibrahim, but perhaps it's as well to bring them away.' We can leave the bundle in the wood. Now go along. I will follow. Perhaps I had better go first. Keep a few paces behind me. They passed through the long passages of the palace, without attracting the slightest attention. Once or twice Dick paused to speak to some officers of his acquaintance, the others stopping respectfully a few paces away. Then he went out into the courtyard and across to the gate, and as the sentries saluted he stopped, and asked them a few questions as to the regiment they belonged to until Ibrahim and his companion, who had passed straight through, were well away. He saw Surajah sitting upon his horse a couple of hundred yards away, and then went to the stables. Chapter 16 The Journey The Sice brought out his horse as soon as he saw Dick approaching. "'You need not wait up for us after nine o'clock,' Dick said as he mounted. "'It's possible that we may be detained and shall not return until tomorrow evening. If we come—' We shall certainly be back by nine at the latest, and we shall not be back before seven, at any rate, so that until then you are free to do as you like. He rode quietly off, and did not quicken his pace until he had got beyond the fort. Then he touched the horse with his heel and cantered it down to the ford. Surajah was halfway across the river when he reached it. The other two figures were just ascending the road up the other bank. Surajah checked his horse when he got across and waited till Dick joined him. "'Shall we go on with them to the farmhouse?' he asked. "'We may as well do so as halt in the road. Besides, there are things Ibrahim took over yesterday to put into our saddlebags. There's another thing that I never thought of. Of course the girl has never been on a horse, and that may give us a good deal of trouble. I wonder I did not think of it, though if I had I don't see that anything else could have been done. We must see how she gets on, and if she cannot manage—' I must take her before me whenever we see that the road is clear for a good distance ahead. Of course it does not matter about country people, but if we see a body of troops coming in the distance, she must mount her own horse again and follow us at a walk. If we find that things don't go well, we must halt in a wood somewhere and ride only by night. They cantered on now and overtook the others just as they reached the farmhouse. The farmer was at his door and looked a little surprised at seeing two of the officers of the palace come up. He salaamed deeply. "'We have not come to requisition anything,' Dick said with a smile, as he saw that the farmer looked alarmed as well as surprised. "'We have only come for the two horses that we have bought for our servants, as we are going on a journey.' "'Can I assist you in any way, my lords?' "'No, our men will saddle the horses,' Dick said, and dismounting went into the stable with Ibrahim and Annie. "'You are not afraid of riding, I hope, Annie,' he said. Oh, I am not afraid of anything, Dick, so that I can but get away. 
We will go quietly at first, anyhow. Mind as you mount, put your left foot in the stirrup. When you are seated, carry yourself as easily as you can. The pony looks quiet enough, but if, when we get fairly off, you find that you cannot sit comfortably, you must get up before me, and Ibrahim must lead your pony. When we are fairly on the road, I will fasten a bit of rope to your bridle to act as a leading rein, and you can ride by my side. Unless we see people coming along, then you must drop behind with Ibrahim. I won't give more trouble than I can help, she said. Ibrahim had taken some rugs over with him on the previous afternoon, which had been bought in case they should sleep out at night. When the horses were saddled, Dick rolled two of these up, strapped one on the high peak and the other on the cantle of the saddle upon which the girl was to ride. "'That will wedge you in pretty tightly,' he said. "'Now, Ibrahim, put the things into the saddle-bag, and then we shall be ready.' When this was done, the two horses were led outside. The farmer had gone back into the house, and Dick, helping the girl into her seat, arranged the stirrups the right length for her. "'Now,' he said, "'you must just keep your knees pressed against the roll of blankets in front, and hold on as well as you can with them, but the principal thing is for you to balance yourself with your body.' Don't sit up stiffly, but as if you were in a chair. Now we will start at a walk. Ibrahim will keep quite close to you, so as to be able to catch hold of your rein, should there be any occasion for him to do so. Then, mounting, he and Surajah rode off at a walk, the others following a length or two behind. Dick looked round from time to time, and saw that Annie exhibited no signs of nervousness. "'I am quite comfortable,' she said, in reply to one of his glances. When they got into the road again, Dick said, we will go at an easy canter now, Annie. If you feel as if you could not keep up, call out, and we'll stop directly. But first come up between Surajah and myself, and we'll take the leading reins, so that you will have nothing to attend to but holding on. Two cords had been attached to the bridle before setting out, and Surajah and Dick each taking one, they started again, the horses instinctively breaking into a canter, which was their usual pace. Annie at first grasped the strap of the rug in front of her, but— as soon as she became accustomed to the motion, she let go. A small rug had been strapped over the saddle before she mounted, and this afforded her a much better hold than she would have had of the leather, and as the pace of the horse was a gentle one, she found it much more easy to keep her seat than she had expected. Moreover, the fact that Dick and Surajah rode close by her side, and would be able to catch her at once if she swayed in the saddle, gave her confidence. "'It's much better than I thought it would be,' she said. It's quite a pleasant motion. I will go faster, if you like." "'No, there's no occasion for that,' Dick replied. "'This is the pace the horses are most accustomed to, and they'll go on longer at it than at any other. There's no fear of pursuit, and we have all day before us.' After a quarter of a mile's riding, they came to a wood. "'We must turn in here,' Dick said. "'We are going treasure-hunting. We hid those caskets that were given us by the ladies directly after we got them, and we are going to dig them up now and take them with us.' They rode at a walk now till they came to a very large baobab tree, growing by the path they were following. Here we turn off. "'There is a man there!' Surajah exclaimed when they had ridden a few yards further. Dick checked his horse. "'It's Pertab, he said in a moment, and in a minute they were beside the Hindu. "'I could not sleep thinking of you, Sahib,' the latter said as they came up. "'So I came across here partly to help you dig up the caskets and partly that I might see you, and assure myself that so far all has gone well. "'Thank you, Pertaub. You have, I see, brought a pickaxe. It will save us half an hour's work, and besides, I am glad to say good-bye again. All has gone well. This is the young lady.' "'She is well disguised,' Pertaub said, bowing his head to Annie. "'She looks so like a boy that, even now you tell me, I can scarce believe she is a white girl. Truly, you can go on without fear that any one will suspect you.' Leading the way to the spot where the caskets had been buried, Dick looked on while Surajah and Ibrahim dug them up. They were then wrapped up in rugs and strapped securely behind their owners' saddles. Then, after a warm adieu to the kind old man, they turned their horses' heads and rode back out of the woods. After riding for three hours at a canter, Dick saw that although Annie still spoke cheerfully, her strength was failing her, and arriving at a wood, he said, "'We'll wait here till the heat of the sun has abated.' You've done very well, and the horses, as well as ourselves, will be glad for a few hours' rest." He alighted from the saddle, gave his horse to Ibrahim, and then lifted Annie from her seat. As he set her down on her feet and loosed his hold of her, she slipped down onto the ground. Dick and Surajah at once raised her and placed her so that as she sat she could lean against a tree. 
Here Dick supported her while Surajah ran and fetched his water-bottle. Annie drank a little, and then said with a nervous laugh, oh, "'It's very silly of me, but I feel better now. My legs seem to just give way altogether.' "'It was not silly at all,' Dick said. "'You have held on most bravely. I can tell you there are not many girls who would have ridden four or five and twenty miles the first time they'd sat on a horse. Why, I can tell you the first time I mounted I did not do a quarter as much, and I was so stiff I could hardly walk when I got down. I should have stopped before, but you kept talking so cheerfully that it seemed to me you could not be anything like as tired as I was then. I was a brute not to have known that you must be thoroughly done up, although you did not say so. We've got some food with us. Do you think you could eat just a little? She shook her head. Not just yet. All right. I brought a couple of bottles of wine I got at one of the trader's stores yesterday. You must take a sip of that, and then we'll leave you for yourself a bit, and you must lie down and have a good nap. Dick took a bottle from his holster, opened it, and gave her some in a tin cup. Then one of the rugs was spread on the ground, with another rolled up as a pillow, and then they led the horses further into the wood, leaving Annie to herself. "'She won't be able to ride again to-night,' Surajah said, as they sat down, while Ibrahim took out the provisions that he had on the previous day carried across to the farm. "'No, I must carry her before me. We'll shift my saddle a little further back, and strap a couple of rugs in front of it so as to make a comfortable seat for her. There is no doubt she'll not be able to ride again by herself.' I am sure that after my first day's riding I could not have gone on again for anything. We won't start until it begins to get dusk. Of course, she ought to have a good twenty-four hours' rest before she goes on, but we dare not risk that. I don't think there is any chance of pursuit for days, or, indeed, of any pursuit at all, for by the time they begin to suspect that we have really deserted, they will know that we have had time to get to the frontier. Still, I don't want to run the slightest risk, and at any rate, if we have to halt, it would be better to do so fifty miles farther on than here. When we mount again, we'll put the saddle-bags from my horse onto hers, and Ibrahim must lead it. Her weight won't make much difference to my horse, and if I find it tiring, I'll change with you. You may as well put your saddle-bags onto her horse as well. It would be better, would it not, Surajah said, if you change to her horse, which will have carried nothing? Yes, yes, of course, that would be best, so you had better not shift your saddle-bags. After they had had their meal, they stretched themselves out for a sleep, and when they woke it was already becoming dusk. The horses had had a good feed, and were now given a drink of water from the skin. They were then saddled again, the blankets carefully arranged for Annie's use, and then they went back to the place where she was lying, still asleep. "'Put the provisions into the wallet again, Ibrahim. We'll see if we can get her up without waking her. She's so dead beat that perhaps we may do so. I don't suppose she'd be able to eat anything if we woke her.' I had better mount first, then you, Surajah, can lift her up to me. I can stoop down and take her from your arms and put her in front of me. She's no weight to speak of. Very, very gently Surajah put his arms under the sleeping girl and lifted her. That's right, Dick said, as he placed her on the blankets before him, and held her with his right arm with her head against his shoulder. She is dead asleep. The blankets were strapped onto the horses again, the others mounted, and they started at a walk out of the wood. As soon as they were on the road the horses broke into a canter again. Annie moaned uneasily, but did not open her eyes. Dick drew her still more closely to him. "'She will do now, Surajah," he said in a low voice. "'I hope that she will sleep till morning.' Half an hour later they rode through Sultan Petta. It was quite dark now, and although there were people in the streets, Dick knew that at any rate they were riding. In the darkness, the fact that he was carrying a lad in front of him would scarce be noticed, nor would it be of any consequence if it were, as, even if they met any officer who should stop and question them, it would suffice to say that the lad had been taken ill, and that, their business being urgent, they were taking him on with them. Four hours later they passed through Concanelli, and crossed the bridge over a branch of the Calvary. Here Dick felt that his horse was flagging. Halting, he dismounted and lifted Annie down. This time the movement woke her. She gave a little cry. "'Where am I?' she asked. "'You are quite safe, child,' Dick said cheerfully. "'Just lie quiet in my arms. We've come five hours' journey, and as my horse is getting tired, I'm changing to yours. Ibrahim is shifting the rugs that you've been sitting on.' "'I, I can go on by myself,' she said, making a little struggle to get down. 
"'You must be good and do what you're told,' he said with a laugh. "'Remember that you are a slave, and I am your master at present.' She said nothing more until they were seated afresh and had gotten into motion. "'Oh, you are good, Dick,' she sighed softly. "'Only to think of your carrying me like this for five hours without waking me.' "'Well, it was much better for us both that you should sleep,' he said. "'And it's the horse that's carrying you, not I. I've been very comfortable, I can assure you. We shall go on for another four hours. After that we shall hide up in a wood and sleep till the afternoon. Then it will depend upon you. If you can sit your horse, we shall ride on through Anacol. If not, we must wait till it gets dark again, and then go on as we are now. Are you comfortable, child? Oh, very comfortable, Dick. They were talking in English now for the first time since they started. I have almost forgotten how to talk English, she said. We white girls always used to talk it when we were together, so as not to forget it and since the last one went three years ago I have always talked it to myself for a bit before going to sleep, so as to keep it up, but it does not come anything like so easy as the other. Still, I like talking it to you. It almost seems as if I were at home again. You see, I have never heard a man talk English since I was carried away. Even now I can hardly believe this is not a happy dream, and that I shall not wake up presently and find myself a slave girl in the harem. It's pleasant for me to talk English, too, Dick said, though it's only a few months since I last spoke it. Now the best thing you can do is to try and get off to sleep again. When we stop, you'll have some breakfast, and I'm sure you must want something. You've had nothing since you ate a mouthful or two in my room before starting. Oh, I have slept hours and hours, she said. I shall not want to sleep any more. However, before long the easy motion lulled her off again, and she did not wake until— at about four o'clock in the morning they entered a wood that was, as Dick supposed, some three or four miles from Anacol. "'Well, how do you feel now?' Dick asked, as he set her on her feet. "'I feel stiff,' she said, "'but that will soon wear off when I have run about a little. Oh, how tired you must be after carrying me all these hours!' "'There has not been much to hold,' Dick said with a laugh, "'especially since we started the last time. Before that you were so dead asleep that I did have to hold you, but you see, you nestled up more comfortably when we changed horses, and needed very little support since then. "'Now, what can I do?' she asked with a little laugh. "'Please order me to do something. I am your slave, you know, and I want to be helping you.' "'Well, then, I command you to aid me to gather some sticks for a fire. We have nothing to cook, but it will be cheerful, and the air is cool.' They picked up sticks, and while Surajah and Ibrahim loosened the girths of the horses, took off their bridles, and poured out another feed from the bag of grain they had brought with them, in a few minutes a fire was blazing and the wallet of provisions brought out. "'I wish I had a cup of coffee to offer you, Annie,' Dick said, as he poured her out some wine and water. "'But we must wait for that until we get down to Tripatli. "'I have forgotten all about coffee, Dick, and what it tastes like. "'The white girls used to talk about it and say how they longed for a cup. "'It seems to me funny to drink anything hot. "'I have never tasted anything but water that I can remember "'until you gave me that wine yesterday.' It was very nice and very refreshing. Uh, there's another drink that's coming into fashion. It's called tea. I've tasted it a few times, but I don't like it as well as coffee, and it's much more expensive. The Sultan says that all the English get drunk, and there used to be pictures of them on the walls. They used to make me so angry. I don't say that no English get drunk, Annie, because there is no doubt that some do but it's very far from being true of the great proportion of them. Tipu only says it to excite the people against us, because now that he has made them all Mohammedans they cannot drink wine, or at any rate openly. When I bought these two bottles the trader made a great mystery over it, and if I had not given him a sign he understood, and which made him believe that I was a Hindu and not a Muslim, he would not have admitted that he kept it at all. He did say so at first, for I have no doubt he thought that as I was an officer of the palace it was a snare, and that if he had admitted he had wine I should have reported him, and it would have served as an excuse for his being fined and perhaps having all his goods confiscated. When I made the sign that an old Hindu had taught me, his manner changed directly, and he took me to the back of his little shop and produced the wine. I told him I wanted it for medicine, and that was quite true, for I thought it was a drug you were very likely to need on your journey. "'How much farther have we to ride?' she asked, after a pause. "'Only about thirty-five miles, that is to say. It's only that distance to the frontier. There is a road that is rather more direct, but it passes through Usur, 
a large town, which we had better avoid. It's not more than fifty miles from the frontier to Tripatli, but since across the line we can take matters easily and stop whenever you get tired. It will be all very strange to me, Dick. I shan't mind it as long as you are with me, but it will be dreadful when you go. I am afraid your mother won't like me. You see, I know nothing of English ways, and I am, oh, so ignorant, I cannot even read, at least very little. One of the girls used to teach me from a book she had when she was carried off. It was a Bible. She used to tell me stories out of it. But one day they found it, and she was beaten very much for venturing to have it. I am afraid I have quite forgotten even my letters. But she and the other girls used to teach me about religion, and told me I must never forget that I was a Christian, whatever they might do to me and I was to say my prayers every night after I lay down, and every morning before I got up. Of course, I have always done it. You need not be afraid of my mother, Annie. She is very kind, and I am sure she will take to you very much, and will be very glad that I have brought you to Tripatli, for, you see, she has no girls of her own. She will teach you to read and write, and if we go back to England, I dare say you will go to school for a time, so as to learn things like other girls. Oh, I can work very nicely, she said. The ladies of the harem all used to say that. Well, you will find that very useful, no doubt. And what else is there to learn, she asked. Oh, no end of things, Annie. At least there are no end of things for boys to learn. I do not know anything about girls, but, of course, you will have to get to know something of history and geography. What is geography, Dick? Well, geography is where countries and places are. For instance, you know something of the geography of India without ever having learnt it. You know that Madras and the Carnatic lie to the east, and Travancore to the southwest, and Malabar to the west, and the Maratha country and the Nizam's dominions to the north. Well, that is the geography of this part of the country, that and the names of the towns and the rivers. In the same way there are a lot of nations in Europe, and you want to know all about them, and where they lie with respect to each other and the names of their principal towns. Then there are America, and Africa, and Asia, and all the countries in them. If you don't know about these things, you can't follow what people are talking about. And did you like learning geography, Dick? she asked, a little anxiously. Well, no, I can't say that I did, Annie. I think I used to hate geography. It was very hard to remember where all the places were and what rivers they stood on. I know very little about it now, except the principal towns and places, but then... I never was very fond of learning anything. I was a very stupid boy at school. Oh, I'm sure you could not have been that, Dick, she said confidently. I was indeed, Annie. I think the only thing I could do well was fighting. I was a beggar to fight, not because I used to quarrel with fellows, but because it made me hard and tough, and my mother thought that it would make me more fit to carry out this search for my father. What did you fight with, swords? Annie asked. Dick laughed. No, no, Annie, when we quarrel in England, we fight with our fists. What is a fist? I never heard of that weapon. That is a fist, Annie. You see, it's hard enough to knock a fellow down, though it does not very often do that. But it hurts him a bit without doing him any harm, except that it may black his eyes or puff up his face for a day or two. And no boy minds that. It accustoms one to bear pain, and is a splendid thing for teaching a boy to keep his temper. And I believe it's one reason why the English make such good soldiers. It's a sort of science, you see, and one learns it just as people here learn to be good swordsmen. I had lessons when I was twelve years old from a little man who used to be a champion lightweight, uh, that is, a man of not more than a certain weight. Annie looked doubtful for a minute, and then exclaimed, Ah, oh, yes, I understand now. That is how it is you came to our help so quickly and bravely when the tiger burst in. Yes, I dare say it had something to do with it, Dick said with a smile. There is no doubt that boxing, as we call it, does make you quick. There is not so much time to waste in thinking how you are to stop a blow and to return it at the same moment. One gets into the habit of deciding at once what is the best thing to be done, and I have no doubt I should not have seen at once that one must cut through the netting, run to the window, jump onto Surajah's shoulders, and fire at the tiger, unless I had been sharpened up by boxing. I only say I suppose that, because there were more, no doubt hundreds of men looking on, who had pluck enough to face the tiger, and who would have gladly done the thing that we did, if the idea had occurred to them. Well, the idea did not occur to them, you see, and I have no doubt that it was just owing to that boxing that I thought of it. So you see, Annie, it was, in a way, the fights I had with boys at Shadwell, which is the part of London where I lived, 
that saved you, and perhaps half a dozen ladies of the Sultan's harem, from being killed by that tiger. Now I should advise you to walk about the wood for at least an hour, to get rid of your stiffness. The longer you walk, the better. When you've tired yourself, come back here. By that time, I dare say, you'll be ready for another sleep. We'll start about three o'clock, and shall cross the frontier before it gets quite dark. Once across, we can camp comfortably where we like, or put up at a village, if we should light upon one. I should not go very far from here, he went on, as the girl at once rose and prepared to start. Very likely the wood may get thicker farther in, and you might lose your way or come across a snake, so I should not go far out of sight. The great thing is to keep moving. It's getting broad daylight now. As soon as Annie had started, Dick lay down. I feel dog-tired, Surajah. This right arm of mine is so stiff I can hardly lift it. I did not feel it at the time, and her weight was nothing, but I certainly feel it now. You have a good sleep, Dick. Ibrahim and I will keep watch by turns. Oh, I don't think there's any occasion for that, Dick said. No one is likely to come into the wood. Not very likely, Surajah agreed. But a body of travellers might turn in here for a halt in the middle of the day, and it would look strange were they to find two of the palace officers and their attendants all fast asleep. They would only think that we came in for a rest a short time before they did, Dick said drowsily. Still, if you don't mind, perhaps it would be best. In two minutes Dick was sound asleep. Now, Ibrahim, you lie down, Surajah said. I will call you in three hours. In half an hour Annie returned. She looked pitifully at Dick, and then seated herself by Surajah. "'He must be tired,' she said. "'It was too bad of me letting him carry me all that night. I thought so over and over again when he believed I was fast asleep, but I knew that it was of no use asking him to let me ride for a bit. You don't mind my sitting here for a little, do you? I am going away again presently. I only came back so soon because I thought he might wonder what had become of me if I did not. I could have gone on walking for a long time.' It was very hard work at first, for my back ached dreadfully, and every step hurt me so. It was as much as I could do to keep on walking, but gradually it got better, and at last I had a long run, and after that I scarcely felt it. "'How long have you known him, Surajah?' and she nodded toward Dick. "'Oh, it is about two years and a half since he came to Tripatli, and I have seen a great deal of him ever since. I love him very much. He is always the same. He never seems to get angry, and is kind to everyone.' Did he fight when he was with the army? Oh, not much. He was one of the general's own officers, and used to ride with the others behind him. He fought in the battle before Seringapatam, for the general and everyone else had to fight then. How is it you came to be always with him? she asked. Oh, it first began when we went out on a scouting expedition together, before the English army went up the ghats. We volunteered to find out, if we could, which way the Sultan's army was going. We went through a good deal of danger together, and some hard fighting, and Asahib was pleased with me, and since then we have always been together. Tell me about that, Surajah. Surajah related the story of their capture and escape, of their making their way through the fort, and the subsequent pursuit, and their defense of the ruined hut. Annie listened almost breathlessly. How I should like to have been with you, she said when he finished. At least I think I should have liked it. I should have been dreadfully in the way, but I could have sat down in the hut and loaded the guns while you were both fighting. You could have shown me how to do it. How brave of you both to have fought fifty or sixty men! It was not so very brave, Surajah said. We knew we should be killed if they took us. There is nothing brave in doing your best when you know that. But it was not so much the fighting as arranging things, and he did all that, and I only carried out his orders. He always seemed to know exactly what was best to be done, and it was entirely his doing our getting through the fort and taking to the hut, and making the loopholes and blocking up the windows, just as it was his doing entirely that we killed the tiger. Whatever he says is sure to be right, and when he tells me to do a thing I do it directly, for I trust him entirely, and there is no need for me to think at all. If he had told me to go up to the Sultan and shoot him in the middle of his officers, I should have done it, though they would have cut me in pieces a minute afterward. I will go away again now, Annie said, getting up. He told me to keep on walking about, and he would not like it if he were to wake up and find me sitting here. And she got up and strolled away again. By the time she returned, Surajah had laid down to sleep, and Ibrahim was on watch. Annie was by this time tired enough to be ready for sleep again. 
and wrapping herself in a rug she lay down a short distance from the others. It was two o'clock when she awoke, and she sprang to her feet as she saw Dick and Surajah standing by the fire talking. "'I was going to wake you soon,' Dick said as she joined them, "'for we must have another meal before we start. I hope you feel all the better after your walk and sleep.' "'Oh, ever so much better. I scarcely feel stiff at all, and shall be ready to ride as soon as you like. How do you feel, Dick?' "'Oh, I'm all right, Annie. I was all right before, though I did feel I wanted to sleep badly. And you see, I've been having a long one, for I only woke up ten minutes ago. I own, though, that I should like a good wash. I don't suppose I can look dirty through this stain, but I certainly feel so. There is a pool, she said, a few hundred yards away there on the right. I found it the second time I went away, and I did enjoy a wash. I thought you were looking wonderfully tidy, Dick said, smiling. Well, I will go there at once. I shall feel a new man after a bath. I will come with you, Surajah said, for he had learned to speak a good deal of English during his companionship with Dick. They returned in half an hour. Ibrahim had warmed up some of the chapatis over the ashes, and they had all thoroughly enjoyed their meal. The horses were saddled and were taken to the pool for a good drink. Then Annie was helped into her saddle, and they started again. They rode at a canter to Anakul, their badges of office securing them from any questioning from the soldiers at the guard-houses, when they entered and left the town. "'I don't know whether there is any post established at the frontier,' Dick said, as Annie, who had ridden behind with Ibrahim as they passed through the town, took her place again between him and Surajah. "'I have no fear that they will be erecting a fort, for after our capturing Bangalore and the hill fortresses, they will know very well that nothing they could build on the flat would be of the slightest use in stopping an army advancing by this line.' Still, there may be a guard placed there. How do you think we had better get past, Surajah? We have still got the order to the governors of forts, and it's likely enough that the officer in charge may not be able to read. Very few of those we met before we were able to do so. The sight of the Sultan's seal at the bottom was quite enough for them, and I should think it would be sufficient to pass us here. Still, it would look suspicious our leaving the country altogether, and we must give some explanation if they ask us. Oh, I might say that we are charged with a mission to the English commander at Kisnagari. Well, that might do, Surajah. The fort is only eight or ten miles on the other side of the frontier, and we might very well be sent on some message, a complaint of some of the villagers that their rights have not been respected as agreed by the treaty, or that they have been robbed by men from this side of the frontier. There are plenty of things about which Tipu might be sending a message to Kisnagari. The worst of it is that Tipu has not given us a mission, and I do hate your having to say what is not true. Surajah was not so particular, and he replied, Well, he has given us a mission to visit the hill-forts, and as Kisnagari is a hill-fort, it's not a very great stretch to include it. Dick laughed. That is ingenious, Surajah. Anyway, I don't see any better excuse for crossing the frontier, and so we must make the best of it but I hope we shan't be asked at all. I think if I say we are going to Kisnagari and then show Tipu's order and seal, that will be sufficient, and the story will be quite true, for we shall go by Kisnagari as the road passes close to the fortress. Yes, that will be quite true, Surajah, and the officers are not likely to ask any further questions. How are you getting on, Annie? Oh, much better than I did yesterday, she said. I would much rather not halt until we are across the frontier. I'm getting accustomed to the motion now, and am not at all afraid of falling off. I dare say I shall be rather stiff when we halt, but that will not matter then. The sun was just setting when they arrived at a newly erected house, around which ten or twelve tents were arranged. An officer came out of the house as they approached. He salaamed on seeing two officials of the palace wearing the emblems of the rank of colonels. Surajah returned to the usual Moslem salute. "'We are going to Kisnagari, he said. "'Here is the Sultan's order.' The officer glanced at the seal, placed it to his forehead, and then stood aside. "'Will you return to-night, my lord? I ask that I may give orders to the sentries. "'No, there is no chance of our being able to be back before morning.' He touched his horse, and they trotted on again. Not a word was spoken until they had gone a few hundred yards, and then Dick checked his horse, and, as Annie came alongside, held out his hand and said, "'Thank God, Annie, that we have got you safe back into English territory.'" Chapter 17 Back at Tripatli 
Annie's lips moved as Dick announced that they had crossed the Mysore boundary, but no sound came from them. He saw her eyes close, and she reeled in the saddle. "'Hold her, Surajah!' Dick exclaimed, "'or she will fall!' Leaning over, Surajah caught her by the shoulder, and Dick, leaping to the ground, stopped her horse, and, lifting her from the saddle, seated her upon a bank and supported her. "'Some water, Surajah!' he exclaimed. Surajah poured a little water from the skin into the hollow of Dick's hand, and the latter sprinkled the girl's face with it. "'I have not fainted,' she murmured, opening her eyes, "'but I, I turned giddy. I shall be better directly.' "'Drink a little wine,' Dick said. Surajah poured some into a cup, but with an effort she sat up and pushed it from her. "'There is there is nothing the matter,' she said, only, only, and she burst suddenly into a passion of sobbing. The spirit that she had shown so long as there was danger had deserted her now that the peril had passed, and she was safe. Dick looked at her helplessly. A girl in tears was a creature wholly beyond his experience, and he had no idea what he ought to do in such an emergency. He therefore adopted what was doubtless the best course, had he but known it, of letting her alone. After a time the violence of her crying abated, and only short sobs broke from her, as she sat with her face hidden in her hands. "'That's right, Annie,' he said, putting his hand on her shoulder. "'It's quite natural for you to cry after the excitement and fatigue you've gone through. You have been very, very brave, and have not said a word of complaint to-day about your fatigue, although you must be desperately tired. Now, try and pull yourself together. It's getting dark already, and we ought to be moving on to Rayakata, which cannot be much more than a mile away. You shall ride in front of me when we get there. I would rather not, she said, getting up with a painful effort. I am awfully foolish, and I am so sorry that I broke down, but I felt so delighted that I could not help it. You said we could camp safely when we once got across the frontier. Would, would you mind doing so, for I don't think I can go much further." "'Certainly we can camp,' Dick said cheerfully, "'but we must get a little farther from that post we passed. "'If they were to see a fire here, they would be sure to suspect something. "'I see a clump of trees a quarter of a mile on. "'We can make our camp there, and I would rather do that myself "'than go on to Ryakata, where our appearance in the Mysore uniform would excite a stir, "'and we should have no end of questions to answer. "'But I am sure that you are not fit to walk even that distance. Now." I will lift you on my saddle, and you can sit sideways. There, I will walk by your side, and you can put your hand to my shoulder to steady yourself. Surajah can lead your horse and his own, and Ibrahim can take mine. In this way they performed the journey to the trees, and then halted. Annie was lifted down and laid on a rug. Dick insisted on her drinking some wine, and then, covering her with another rug, they left her and lighted a fire fifty yards away. Look here, Ibrahim. Put that whole chicken into the pan, cover it with water, and let it stew. Don't let it boil fast, but just simmer until it falls all to pieces. Then I will wake her, if she has gone to sleep, and make her drink the broth. It will do her ever so much more good than wine, and she'll be all right in the morning, though no doubt she will be desperately stiff again. Still, it has not been a longer ride than she had yesterday. I expect it's the excitement more than the fatigue that has upset her. Tomorrow she must ride in front of me again. An hour and a half later, Dick went across with the cup full of strong broth. "'Are you asleep, Annie?' he said, when he reached her side. "'No, I am not asleep. There is so much to think of, and it's such happiness to know that I am free, that I feel quite wide awake. Besides, you know, I have been asleep for hours today, and I slept all night as I was riding before you. Then sit up and drink this hot broth. It will do you good. And after that, I hope you will go off.' You won't be fit for anything tomorrow if you don't have a good night. You'll have plenty of time to think as we ride along. The girl did as she was told. It is very nice, she said as she handed the cup back to him. Oh, Dick, I do hope that we shall find my father and mother. I don't want to for some things, but I do for others, and most of all that they may thank you for all your goodness to me, which I shall never be able to do myself. Nonsense, child, he said cheerfully. I've done what everyone would do, if they found a little countrywoman in distress. I should have gone away from Seringapatam anyway, if I had not met you, and getting you down is a good excuse for me to go back and spend a fortnight with my mother. Now get off to sleep as quickly as you can. We'll see what we can do to make things comfortable for your ride tomorrow. It was late when Annie woke. The sun was some distance above the horizon, and she saw her companions occupied with the horses. In a few minutes she joined them. I am ashamed of sleeping so long, she said. 
"'We were glad to find that you did,' Dick replied. "'If you went to sleep soon after I brought you the broth, you have had ten hours of it, and ought to feel all the better.' "'I do,' she said. "'I am very stiff, but not so stiff as I was yesterday morning. "'How you are both altered!' "'Yes, it would never have done to have gone on in our gay dresses and Tippoo's badges. "'These are the clothes we came up in, and we shall attract no attention whatever. "'You won't have to ride far to-day. "'It will be as well for you to keep to your own horse "'until we have passed through Ryakata, which is not much more than half a mile away. "'After that you must sit on this pad I have fastened behind my saddle.' You can sit sideways, you know, and put your arm around me, just as ladies used to ride in England a couple of hundred years ago. As soon as they had eaten something, they started, and rode at a good pace to the little town. People looked at them somewhat curiously as they passed through the street, wondering that they should have come from Mysore, but as they did not halt, no one asked any questions. The population were at present a good deal divided. The great majority by no means regretted their change of masters. Some of the Mohammedans had left when the place was taken over by the English, and had crossed into Mysore. Others had remained, and hoped that ere long Tippoo would drive back the British, and regain his former dominions. Before mounting, the rich housings and the silverwork on the bridles had been removed, and hidden among the rugs, and there was nothing beyond the excellence of two of the horses, and the direction from which they came, to attract attention. When well beyond the town they halted. The saddlebags were all packed upon Annie's horse, Dick lifted the girl on to the pad behind his saddle, and then mounted. "'Now hold tight by me,' he said, "'and mind, whenever you are tired, we will halt for an hour's rest. We'll not go more than twenty miles to-day, and then it will only be as much more down to Tripotli to-morrow. We'll walk for a bit until you get quite accustomed to your seat.' After a while the horses broke into a gentle canter. For a time Annie felt very doubtful as to whether she could retain her seat, and so held tight with one arm to Dick while with the other hand she kept a firm hold of the crupper. Presently, however, she was able to release her hold of the latter, and it was not long before she was able honestly to assure Dick that she felt quite comfortable, and had no fear of falling off. In two hours they passed near the hill on which stood the fortress of Krishnagari, which had successfully resisted the attack of the English, but above which now flew the British flag. Skirting round the foot they came in the course of an hour and a half's ride, on to the direct road which they had left at Anakul, in order to avoid passing through the town of Usur. Here they came upon a large village, and Dick found no difficulty in hiring a light native cart to take Annie, who was, as he felt by the relaxation of her hold, unable to proceed further on horseback, to continue straight through to Tripatli. A thick layer of straw was placed at the bottom of the cart, a couple of rugs spread over it, and on this Annie was enabled to lie down at her ease. The horses were fed and watered, had an hour's rest, and then they started for the last twenty miles of their journey. Annie had, while the horses were resting, a chat with a native woman, and had gone into her house with her. When they were ready for the start, she returned, dressed in the costume she had worn in the palace. It had originally been intended to get rid of the clothes after starting, but Annie had asked for them to be taken on. "'I can change again before I get to Trapatli, she said. I should not like to appear before your mother for the first time dressed as a boy. And Dick had at once fallen in with her wishes. The turban was gone, and her head was covered in the fashion of native women, with a long cotton cloth of a deep red color. Where the road was good, the cart proceeded at a fair pace, but in the pass down the ghats they could go only at a walk, and the sun had set before they reached Tripatli. Dick, seeing that Annie was growing very nervous, as they neared their destination, had ridden all the way by the side of the cart, chatting cheerfully with her. "'Why, Annie,' he said, "'you look as solemn as if you were just going into slavery instead of having escaped from it.' "'It's not that I feel solemn, Dick. It's that everything is so new and strange. Of course, after your saving my life, I have never felt that you were a stranger, and as long as there were only you and Suraj, I did not mind, and I have felt quite at home with you. But now that I am going to a new place where I don't know anyone, I can't help feeling desolate.' You'll feel quite as much at home with them in twenty-four hours as you have done with me, Annie. You're tired now and quite worn out with your journey, and so you'll take a gloomy view of things. I will guarantee that before I go away again you will be good friends with everyone, and will wonder how you could have thought it to be anything dreadful to come among them. When they got within a mile of Tripatli, Dick said, Now I will ride on ahead, Annie, and prepare my mother for your coming. It will be pleasant to have no questions or explanations when you arrive, 
and I am sure she will carry you straight off to bed and keep you there until you have quite got over the effects of your journey. He did not wait to hear Annie's faint protest against his leaving her, but telling Surajah to take his place beside the cart, and to keep talking to the girl, he galloped on ahead. He sprang from his horse in the courtyard, threw the reins to a servant, and ran in. The party had just sat down to their evening meal, and as he entered he was greeted by exclamations of astonishment and welcome. His mother had received two letters sent through Pertaub by traders going down from Seringapatam. In these he had told her, first, of his arrival, and of the adventure with the tiger, and of his obtaining the post in the palace, and in the second of the non-success that had attended his visits to the hill-forts. He had told her that he should probably leave Seringapatam shortly and continue the search, but that she must not anticipate any result for a long time. "'Well, mother,' he said, after the first embrace and greetings were over, "'I have left Tipu's service, you see, and am no longer a colonel or an officer of the palace. I have come down to spend a fortnight with you before I set out again on my travels.' "'Has Surajah come back with you, Dick?' the Rajah asked. "'Yes, he'll be here in a few minutes with a cart. That's one of the reasons why I came down here. I found among the slaves of the harem a white girl about fourteen years old. She's the daughter of a British officer named Mansfield, and was carried away from her parents eight years ago. She was the only white captive left in the palace. There have been other girls in a similar position, but they have all at about fourteen or fifteen been given by Tippoo to his officers, as would have been her fate before long. So I determined to carry her off with me and bring her to you until we could find her parents. She's a very plucky girl, and although she had never been on a horse before, rode all the way down until we got this side of Kishnagari. But as you may imagine, the poor little thing is completely knocked up as we brought her down from there in a cart. It is something, mother, to have saved one captive from Tippoo's grasp, even though it's not the dear one that I was looking for, and I promised that you would be a mother to her until we could restore her to her friends. Oh, certainly I will, Dick, Mrs. Holland said warmly. Will you tell the girls, Gola, she said to her sister-in-law, to have a bed made up for her in my room? I will do so at once, the Rani said. Poor little thing, she must have had a journey indeed. She'll be here directly, mother, Dick said, as his aunt gave the necessary directions for the bed to be prepared, and a dish of rice and strong gravy. She's very nervous, and I'm sure it will be best if you will meet her when she arrives, and take her straight to her room. That is what I was going to do, Dick, his mother said with a smile. Well, I will go down with you at once. Two or three minutes later the cart entered the courtyard. Mrs. Holland was on the steps. Dick ran down and helped Annie from the cart. The girl was trembling violently. Don't be afraid, Annie, Dick whispered as he lifted her down. Here is my mother waiting to receive you. This is the young lady, he went on cheerfully as he turned to his mother. I promised her a warm welcome in your name. Mrs. Holland had already come down the steps, and as the girl turned to her, she took her in her arms and kissed her in a motherly fashion. "'Welcome, indeed,' she said. "'I will be a mother to you, poor child, till I can hand you over to your own. I thank God for sending you to me. It will be a comfort to me to know that, even if my son should never bring my husband back to me, he has at least succeeded in rescuing one victim from Tipu, and in making one family happy.' The girl clung to her, crying softly. "'Oh, how good you all are!' she sobbed. "'It seemed too much happiness to be true.' "'It is quite true, dear. Come with me. We'll go up the private stairs, and I will put you straight to bed in my room, and no one else shall see you or question you until you are quite recovered from your fatigue.' "'I am afraid,' Annie began faintly. She did not need to say more. Mrs. Holland interrupted her. "'Dick, you must lift her up and carry her into my room. Poor child, she's utterly exhausted, and no wonder.' A couple of minutes later Dick returned to the dining-room. He had run down first to tell Surajah to come up with him, but found that he had already gone to his father's apartments. "'Well, Dick,' the Rajah said as he entered, "'I was prepared after hearing of that tiger adventure, of you and Surajah being colonels in Tipu's household, for almost anything. But I certainly never dreamt of your returning here with an English girl.' "'I suppose not, Uncle. Such a thing certainly never entered into my calculations.' I did not even know there was a white girl in the palace, until one day she stopped me as I was passing along the corridor near the harem, to thank me for saving her life, for it was this girl that the tiger had struck down, and was standing upon when I fired at him. Of course she had no idea that I was English. We only said a few words then, for if I had been seen talking to a slave girl belonging to the harem, I might have got into a scrape. 
However, I saw her afterwards, and she told me about herself, and how she was afraid that she would be given away to one of Tippoo's officers. Of course, I could not leave her to such a fate as that. There was really no difficulty in getting her away. She was dressed as a boy, and only had to ride with our servant after us. We had arranged so that our absence would not be noticed until we had been away for at least twenty-four hours, and, of course, as officers of the palace, no one questioned us on the journey, so that it is a very simple affair altogether, and the only difficulty there was rose from her being completely tired out and exhausted by the journey, as she was utterly unaccustomed to travelling. I had to carry her one night in front of me on my saddle, for she was scarce able to stand. I am not surprised at that. A journey of a hundred and fifty miles to anyone who has never been on horseback would be a terrible trial, especially to a young girl. I really wonder that she did not break down altogether. Why, you can remember how stiff you were yourself the first day or two you were here, and that after riding only an hour or two. I know, uncle, and I should not have been at the least surprised if she had collapsed. I talked it over with Surajah, and we agreed that if she could not go on, we must hire a vehicle of some sort and let her travel every day in front of us with Ibrahim, and that if it delayed us too much that there was any possibility of our being overtaken, we would have put on our peasants' dresses, got rid of our horses, and have gone forward on foot. However, she kept up wonderfully well, and always made the best of things. We won't ask you to tell us anything more, Dick, till your mother joins us, or you will have to go over the story twice. No, uncle, and I can assure you I don't want to tell the story until I have had my supper, for our meals have not been very comfortable on the road, and I have not eaten anything since early this morning. What is Tipu doing, Dick? Well, as far as I can see, uncle, he's preparing for war again. He's strengthening all his forts, building fresh defenses to Serengapatam, and drilling numbers of fresh troops. The English general made a great mistake in not finishing with him when he was there. We ought to have taken the city, sent Tipu down a prisoner to Madras, and there tried him for the murder of scores of Englishmen, and hung him over the ramparts. We shall have all our work to do over again in another four or five years. However, it will not be such a difficult business as it was last time, now that we have the passes in our hands. There is no doubt, uncle, that a considerable part of the population will be heartily glad when Tipu's power is at an end. You see, he and Hyder were both usurpers and had no more right to the throne than you had. Quite so, Dick, and that makes our letting him off, when we could have taken the capital easily, all the more foolish. If he had been the lawful ruler of Mysore, it might not have been good policy to push him too hard, for he would have had the sympathy from all the native princes of India. But as being only the son of an adventurer, who had deposed and ill-treated the lawful ruler of Mysore, it would seem to them but a mere act of justice if the English had dethroned him and punished him provided, of course, they put a native prince on the throne, and did not annex all his dominions. It has all got to come some day. I can see that in time the English will be the rulers of all India, but at present they are not strong enough to face a general coalition of the native states against them, and any very high-handed action in Mysore might well alarm the native princes throughout India into laying aside their quarrels with each other and combining in an attempt to drive the English out. Just as they had finished their meal, Mrs. Holland entered. "'The poor child is asleep,' she said. She wanted to talk at first and to tell me how grateful she was to you, Dick. But, of course, I insisted on her being quiet, and said that she should tell me all about it in the morning. She ate a few mouthfuls of the rice, and not long after she lay down, she fell asleep. I have left Sundra sitting there in case she should wake again, but I don't think it's likely that she will do so. Now, Dick, you must tell us all about it.' Dick was not a great hand at writing letters, so he had not entered with any fullness into the details of what he was doing, the principal point being to let his mother know that he was alive and well. Before he begins, the Rajah said, I will send to Raj Bulab and Suraja. Master Dick is rather fond of cutting his story short, and we must have Suraja here to fill up details. Suraja and his father soon appeared. The former was warmly greeted by the Rajah, and when they had seated themselves on a divan, Dick proceeded to tell the story. He was not interrupted until he came to the incident of the killing of the tiger, and here Surajah was called upon to supplement the story, which he did, doing full credit to the quickness with which Dick had, without a moment's loss of time, cut the netting and ascended to the window. When Dick came to the incident of the ladies of the harem presenting them in Tipu's presence with the two caskets, Mrs. Holland broke in, "'You did not say anything about that in your letter, Dick.' 
Let me see your casket. Where is it? Oh, it's in one of the saddlebags, Dick said. They are in my room, Raj Bulub corrected. Surajah brought them up at once. Then he had better get them, the Rajah said. What do they contain, Dick, he asked, as Surajah left the room. All sorts of things, necklaces and rings, some of them are stones, as if they had been taken out of their settings. Pertob said they had done this because they thought, perhaps, that Tippoo might not allow the jewels they had worn to be sold or worn by anyone else. Then I should think that they must be valuable, the Rani said. Pertob said they were worth a good deal, but I don't know whether he really knew about the cost of precious stones. Some of the things were of small value, being, I suppose, the trinkets of the slave girls. All gave something. And there's a little cross there that belonged to Annie. It has her initials on it, and she had it on her neck when she was captured. It was the thing she valued most, and therefore she gave it. I don't suppose she had anything else except the usual trinkets she would wear when she went out on special occasions with the ladies of the harem. I thought it would be useful to us to prove who she was. Surajah now returned with the casket. You'd better look at Surajah's first, Dick said. I don't know anything about it, but it looks as if mine were the more valuable. I wanted Surajah to put them all together and divide fairly, but he would not. My son was perfectly right, Raj Bulub said. If it had not been for the young lord, the deed would never have been done at all. Surajah aided in killing the tiger, but that was nothing more than he has done on the hills here. It is to you the merit is entirely due. The purse that Sultan gave my son was in itself an ample reward for the share he took in it. Now, Surajah, open your casket. The ladies are waiting to see the contents. The whole of the little packets, some fifty in number, were opened and examined, many of them eliciting exclamations of admiration from the Rani and Mrs. Holland. There is no doubt that many of them are worth a good deal of money, the Rajah said. It is certain that Tippoo's treasuries are full of the spoils he has carried off, from the states he has overrun, and the ladies of the harem, no doubt, possess a store of the jewels, and could afford to be liberal to those whom they considered had saved their lives. These seven, which you put together as the best, must alone be worth a large sum. I should think that the total value of the whole cannot be less than forty or fifty thousand rupees, so that if those in your casket are handsomer than these, Dick, they must be valuable indeed. Dick's casket was next examined. Some of these stones are magnificent, Dick. These three great diamonds could only be valued by a jeweller accustomed to such things, for their value depends upon their being of good luster and free from all flaws. But according to my judgment, I should say that, at the very least, they must be worth ten thousand rupees each. That pearl necklace is worth at least as much. Those rubies are superb. I should say, lad, that the value of the whole cannot be less than fifteen thousand pounds. The harem must be rich in jewels, indeed, to be able to make such gifts. Not that I am surprised at that. Tippoo had all the jewels belonging to the lawful rulers of Mysore. He has captured all of those of Coorg, Travancore, and the other states of the Malabar coast. He and his father have looted all the Karnatak from Cape Cameron to the north of Madras. He has captured many of the Nizam cities and several Maratha provinces. In fact, he has accumulated at Serengapatam the spoils of the whole of southern India, and those of the Hindu portion of his own people. The value of the jewels alone must be millions of pounds, and as he himself, as they say, dresses simply, and only wears one or two gems of immense value, he may well have bestowed large quantities upon his harem, especially as these would be in fact only loans, as at the death of their wearers they would revert to him, or indeed could be reclaimed at any moment in a freak of bad temper. I have no doubt they had to ask his permission to give you the presents, and as you at the moment were in high favour with him, I dare say he suffered them to give what they chose, without inquiring at all into their value. The gold he gave you was simply to procure your outfits, and he left it to the harem to reward you as they chose for the service you had rendered. Well, Dick, I congratulate you heartily. It places your future beyond doubt, and leaves you free to choose any mode of life that you may prefer. I congratulate you, too, Margaret, on the lad's good fortune, which he has well deserved by his conduct. See this, my sons. Here you have proof of the advantages of the training your cousin has had. The quickness and coolness he has acquired by it enabled him to make his way down through the fort at the top of the pass, and to defend the ruined hut against the fifty enemies. Now it has enabled him to seize the opportunity, opened by the attack of the tiger on Tippoo's harem, thereby gaining the Sultan's favour, his appointment to the rank of colonel in the Mysore army, 
a post in his palace and this magnificent collection of gems. Without that quickness and decision, his courage alone would have done little for him. We in India have courage, but it is because our princes and nobles are brought up in indolence and luxury that the English, though but a handful in point of numbers, have become masters of such wide territories. Surajah is as brave as Dick, but he would be the first to tell you that it is to Dick he owes it that, on their first excursion together, he escaped with his life, and that in this last adventure he attained rank and position, and has returned with these valuable gifts. It is indeed, my lord, Surajah said. The young lord has been my leader, and I have tried to carry out his orders. Alone I could never have got through the gate in the fort, and should no more have thought of going into the assistance of the ladies of the Sultan's harem than did any other of the thousands of men who were there looking on. So you see, boys, the Rajah went on, that though when he came out here your cousin was able neither to shoot nor to ride, and can neither shoot nor ride as well now as can tens of thousands of natives, he has acquired from his training in rough exercises qualities of infinitely greater value than these accomplishments, and I do hope that his example will stir you up to take much greater interest than, in spite of my advice, you have hitherto done in active sports and exercises. Your grandmother was an Englishwoman, and I want to see that, with the white blood in your veins, you have some of the vigour and energy of Englishmen." It was some days before Annie Mansfield left her room. For the first two she had been completely prostrated. After that she rapidly gained strength, but Mrs. Holland thought it best to insist upon her remaining perfectly quiet until she had quite recovered. Either she or the Rani were constantly with her, so that, when at the end of a week she made her first appearance at the breakfast-table, she was already at home with three of the party. Before long her shyness completely wore off, and she seemed to have become really a member of the family. Mrs. Holland had altered two of her dresses to fit her, but she preferred for a time to dress in Indian costume, to which she was accustomed, and which was, indeed, much better suited to the climate than the more closely fitting European dress. Mrs. Holland, however, bargained that she should, of an evening, wear the frocks that she had made for her. "'You must get accustomed to them, my dear, so that when you find your own people you will not be stiff and awkward, as you certainly will be, when you dress in English fashion for the first time.' The day after his arrival Dick had written to the military secretary of the governor of Madras, with whom he was well acquainted, to tell him that, having gone up in disguise to Seringapatam, to endeavour to ascertain the fate of his father, he had discovered a young English girl detained as a slave in Tipu's harem, and that he had enabled her to effect her escape, and had placed her in the charge of his mother. He then repeated the account Annie had given of her capture, and asked if the circumstances could be identified, and if the officer, of the name of Mansfield, concerned in it, was still alive, and if so, was he still in India? Annie was secretly dreading the arrival of the answer. After her life as a slave her present existence seemed to her so perfectly happy that she shrank from the idea of any fresh change. She had no memory whatever of her parents, and had already a very strong affection for Mrs. Holland. She liked the Rani very much also, and the absence of all state and ceremony in the household of the Rajah was to her delightful. She was already on good terms with the boys, and as to Dick she was always ready to go with him if he would take her, to run messages for him, or to do anything in her power, and indeed watched him anxiously, as if she would discover and forestall his slightest wish. "'One would think, Annie,' he said one day, "'that you were still a slave and that I was your master. I don't want you to wait on me, child, as you waited on the ladies of the harem. However, as I shall be going away in a few days now, it doesn't matter. But I should grow as lazy as a young rajah if this were to go on long. "'What shall I do when you go away, Dick?' Well, I hope that you will set to work hard to learn to read and write, and other things my mother will teach you. You would not like when you find your own people to be regarded by girls of your own age as an ignorant little savage. And I want you to set to and make up for lost time, so that if you are still here when I come back, I shall find you have made wonderful progress. Oh, I do hope I shan't be gone before that, Dick. I am afraid you must make up your mind to it, Annie, for there is no saying how long I may be away next time. You see, there is not much chance of my lighting upon another white slave-girl, and having to bring her down here, and I shall go in for a long, steady search for my father. I don't want you to find another slave-girl, Dick, she said earnestly. Not even if it brought you down here again, I should not like that at all. Why not, Annie? Oh, you might like her ever so much better than me. 
I should like you to do all sorts of brave things, Dick, and to save people as you have saved me, but I would rather there was not another girl. Dick laughed. Well, I don't suppose that there is much chance of that. Besides, I can't turn my uncle's palace into a home for lost girls. Two days before Dick and Surajah started again, the reply from the military secretary arrived. It stated that the time and circumstances pointed out that the place besieged and forced to surrender, eight years before, was Corsopan, and this was indeed rendered a certainty by the fact that the officer in command was Captain Mansfield. He had with him a half-company of Europeans and three companies of sepoys. On looking through the official papers at the time, he had found Captain Mansfield's report, in which he stated that on the night after leaving the fort, the troops, which had been reduced to half their original strength, had been attacked by a party either of dacoits or irregular troops. Fearing that some such act of treachery might be attempted, he had told his men to conceal a few cartridges under their clothes when they marched out with empty cartridge pouches. They had, on arriving at their halting place, loaded, and when the dacoits fell upon them, had opened fire. The robbers doubtless expected to find them defenseless, and, speeding into the confusion, some of them had penetrated far into the camp and had carried off the captain's daughter, a child of six years old. When peace was signed with Tipu three weeks afterwards, the commissioners were ordered to make special inquiries as to this child, and to demand her restoration. They reported that Tipu denied all knowledge of the affair, and neither she nor any of the other girls there were ever given up. The letter went on. There can be no doubt that the young lady you rescued is the child who was carried off and the initials you speak of on the cross may certainly be taken as proof of her identity. Her father retired from the service last year with the rank of colonel. I am, of course, ignorant of his address. As you say that Mrs. Holland will gladly continue in charge of her, I would suggest that you should write a letter to Colonel Mansfield, stating the circumstances of the case, and saying that, as soon as you are informed of his address, the young lady will be sent to England. I will enclose the letter in one to the board of directors, briefly stating the circumstances, and requesting them to forward the enclosure to Colonel Mansfield. To Annie the letter came as a relief. It would be nearly a year before a letter could be received from her father. Until then she would be able to remain in her new home. CHAPTER Eighteen, A NARROW ESCAPE Mrs. Holland undertook to write the letter to Annie's father, and did so at very much greater length than Dick would have done, giving him the story of the girl's life at Serengapantam, the circumstances of her meeting Dick, and the story of her escape. She assured him that his daughter was all that he could wish her to be. She is of a very affectionate disposition. She is frank, outspoken, and natural, qualities that are wonderful considering the years she has passed as a slave in the harem. Now that she has been with us for a fortnight, and has recovered from the fatigue of her flight, and is beginning to feel at home, she has regained her natural spirits after their long repression. Personally, she is about the average height, and of a more graceful figure than is usual with girls of her age. The stain has now worn off her face, and I should say she will, as she grows up, be pretty. She is fair rather than dark, has expressive eyes, and a nice mouth. Altogether, had I a daughter, I should be well content if she resembled your Annie. I shall, I can assure you, do my best to supply the place of a mother to her, until I receive a letter from you, and shall part from her with regret. She is, of course, at present entirely uneducated, but she has already begun to learn with me, and, as she is quick and intelligent, I hope that before I resign my charge her deficiencies will be so far repaired that she will be able to pass muster in all ordinary matters. "'You will be back before I go, won't you, Dick?' Annie said, as she sat by his side on a seat in the garden on the evening before he was to start. "'I think so. We can calculate on your being here ten months, anyhow. I have been talking it over with my mother.' If it had not been for those jewels, I should have given up the search for my father after another six months, because it would have been high time for me to get to work in some profession. I had indeed made up my mind to enter the company's service, for Lord Cornwallis promised me a commission, and my uncle received a letter some time ago from the governor of Madras, saying that on the very strong recommendation of Lord Cornwallis and his report of my services, he was authorized to grant me one. It was to be dated back to the time I joined Lord Cornwallis, more than two years ago. However, now that I am really made independent of a profession, I shall probably continue my search for a somewhat longer time. But, at any rate, I will promise to come back at the end of ten months from the present time, 
so as to say good-bye to you before you start. The girl's face brightened. My uncle would take you down bodily and put you on board, Dick laughed. Mind, Annie, when I come back at the end of ten months, I shall expect to find you quite an educated young lady. I shall think of all sorts of hard questions in geography and history to put to you. I will try hard, Dick, really hard, to please you. I have had three lessons, and I have learnt all the letters quite well. That's a good beginning, Annie. It took me a lot longer than that, I know. The next morning Dick and Surajah started. They were to ride up the ghats to the frontier line at Ambur, two troopers accompanying them to bring back their horses. There they were to disguise themselves as traders and make their way direct to Bangalore. Dick said good-bye to his mother up in her own room. "'You must not be downhearted, mother,' he said, as she tried in vain to keep back her tears. "'You see, I have come back to you twice safely, and after passing unsuspected in Tipu's palace, there is no fear of my being detected elsewhere. Besides, of course, every month I am there I become better acquainted with the people, and can pass as a native more easily. "'I am not really afraid, my boy. You have got on so well that it seems to me God will surely protect you and bring you back safely.' and I can't help thinking that this time your search may be successful. You know why I feel convinced that your father is still alive, and, in spite of past disappointments, I still cling to that belief. Well, mother, if he is to be found, I'll find him. There are still many hill forts where he may be living and his very existence forgotten, and until I have visited every one of them I don't mean to give up the search. Anyhow, I shall come back at the end of ten months, whether I have heard of him or not. I promised Annie that I will be back before she sails. It's not a very long journey down here, and I shall drop in for a fortnight's stay with you, as I have done this time. She's in the next room, crying her eyes out, Dick. You had better look in there and say good-bye to her. She is not fit to go down to the door. After parting with his mother, Dick went in to see Annie. You must not cry so, child, he said, as she rose from the divan with her face swollen with crying. I am sure that you'll be very happy here until I come back. I know, Dick, but it won't be at all the same without you. Oh, you'll have plenty to do, and you'll soon fall into regular ways. Besides, you know, you've got to comfort my mother and keep up her spirits, and I quite rely upon you to do that. I will try, Dick, she said earnestly. Now, good-bye, Annie. He held out his hand, but she threw her arms around his neck and kissed him. You have never kissed me, not once, she said reproachfully, and you are going away without it now. Your mother kisses me, and the English girls in the harem always used to do so. But that is different, Annie. Girls and women do kiss each other, but boys and girls do not kiss unless they are brothers and sisters, or are relations, or something of that sort. But you are not a boy. You are a great big man, Dick. I'm not much more than a boy yet, Annie. However, there's no harm in kissing when one is saying good-bye. So there. Now, be a good girl and don't fret. And he ran downstairs to the door where his uncle and the two boys were standing. "'Take care of yourself, lad,' the Rajah said, as, after bidding them good-bye, Dick sprang upon his horse. "'Whenever you get a chance, send down a letter, as we arranged last night, to the care of Azul Afur, traitor, Tripatli. That will seem natural enough, whoever you send it by, while a letter directed to me might excite suspicion. Good-bye.' "'Good-bye, uncle,' and with a wave of his hand Dick rode off and joined Saraja who was waiting for him a short distance off, and then, followed by Ibrahim, who had begged so earnestly to be allowed to accompany them that Dick had consented to take him, feeling indeed that his services would be most useful to them, and the two troopers, they rode off at a sharp pace. At Ambur they assumed their disguises. Dick purchased a pack-pony and some goods suitable to their appearance as peddlers, and then they started up the pass on foot. They passed the frontier line without any interruption, stopped and chatted for a few minutes with the guard, and then passed on up the valley. "'There is a house where we had our fight, Surajah,' Dick said, as they reached the ruined village. "'Though there is peace now, I fancy we should not get much farther than that fort ahead, if they guessed that we were the fellows who gave them such trouble two years and a half ago.' "'There is no fear of our being recognized,' Surajah said. "'The guard has probably been changed long ago.' Besides, they never once caught sight of our faces. Oh, no, we're safe enough, Dick agreed. If it had not been sure of that, we would have gone up one of the passes to the south that has been ceded to us, though it would have been a great deal longer round to Bangalore. Unless, indeed, we had gone to Krishnagiri, 
and that would have been too dangerous to attempt, for the officers on the frontier would probably have recognized us. It was late in the afternoon before they arrived at the gate. It stood open, and there was no sentry on duty. A few soldiers could be seen loitering about in the street, but it was evident that now that the war was over and everything finally settled, it was considered that all occasion for vigilance was at an end. Upon making inquiries they soon found a house where they could put up for the night. They had, as is the custom in India, brought their provisions with them, and after leaving their goods in the house and seeing that the horse was fed, Ibrahim set to work to cook a meal, while the others opened one of the packs and went round the village, where they disposed of a few small articles. They arrived without any adventure at Bangalore. There, as soon as they had established themselves at one of the caravansaries for travellers, Dick and Surajah went to the house of the trader to whom Pertab had promised to consign their goods. "'We have come for some packs that have been sent by friends of ours at Seringapatam to your care,' Dick said, making, as he spoke, the sign that Pertab had taught him, as enabling those who were Hindus to recognize each other, at once. We were to use the word Madras as a sign that we were the parties to whom they were consigned. "'The goods arrived a week ago,' the trader said, "'and are lying for you at my warehouse. I will hand them over to you to-morrow morning.' "'Thank you. We may not come early, for we have purchased two pack-horses to carry them, and three tats for ourselves and our man. This may take us some time, and it will be perhaps better for us to come to you early the next morning, and we can then start away direct.' This was arranged, and on the following day two strong animals were bought for the packs, and three tats, or ponies, for their own riding. Dick had disposed of the horse he had ridden down to Tripatli for a good price, and had also been supplied with funds by his mother, although, as he said, the contents of their packs ought to suffice to pay all their expenses for a long time. Then they purchased some provisions for the journey. The pack-horse they had brought with them was laden with these, and the goods brought up from Ambur. The new pack-horses were taken round to the traders, and the goods sent from Seringapatam packed on them. Then they mounted and rode off at a walk, the pack-animals following Ibrahim's horse, tied one behind the other. They had already debated upon the course to pursue, and finally decided that they would, in the first place, again visit Savandrug, for the conviction Dick had entertained that there was at least one white captive there had increased rather than diminished. I can't give you any good reason for it, Surajah, he had admitted, when they talked it over before starting, but it's just because I have no good reason to give that I want to go there again. Why should I have such a strong conviction without a good cause? One has heard of a presentiment of evil. I can't help feeling that this is a presentiment of good. The question is, how can we best go there again? I don't think it's in the least likely that the Governor will have heard of our flight, as this would be the last direction anyone would think of our taking, for had we done so, we might have met the Sultan on his way back from Bangalore. It will naturally be supposed that we have made for the frontier, and have descended the western or southern ghats. The affair will, of course, seem a mystery to them altogether, for why should two young fellows so recently promoted and in such high favour desert Tipu's service? If they did not associate Annie's disappearance with our flight, and there is no reason on earth why they should do so, as no one ever saw us speaking to her, they will most likely think that we have fallen into the hands of the dacoits or thugs, and have been murdered. Numbers of people do disappear every year, and are, as every one supposes, victims of that detestable sect. My uncle has told me of thugs. He warned me to be very careful if I travelled with strangers, for that these men travel in all sorts of disguises. So I think that, as far as that goes, we could boldly put on our uniforms and badges again and ride into Savandrug. The disadvantage of doing so is, however, plain. The commander would remain with us all the time. We should get no opportunity of speaking privately with any of the soldiers, and, taking us to be in Tipu's confidence, he would, as before, shirk the question of prisoners. On the other hand, if we can get in as traitors, we shall be able to move about unwatched, to go to the soldiers' huts and offer goods to their wives, and be able to find out to a certainty if there is a prisoner there, and, if so, where he is kept. We may even see him. For a while, if the governor wished to keep his existence a secret, he would have shut him up when he heard that two of Tipu's officers were coming. He would not trouble about it one way or the other in the case of a couple of traders. The only objection to that course is that we were here but two or three months since, and he and his servants and that artillery officer we went round with would know us at once. 
If we go, we shall have to alter our appearance completely. At any rate, we had better provide means for disguise, and we can use them, or not, as we please. While they were at Tripatli, therefore, they had two false beards made for themselves, and tried many experiments in the way of painting their faces, and found that by tracing light lines on their foreheads and at the corners of their eyes, they were able, by the help of beards, to counterfeit the appearance of old age, so well that it could only be detected on close observation. Dick, too, had purchased a pair of native spectacles with large round glasses and broad black horn rims that made him look, as he said, like an astonished owl. It was agreed that Surajah should wear under his dress a very thickly padded vest, which would give him the appearance of being fat, as well as elderly. They proceeded for seven or eight miles at a walking pace, and when the heat of the day rendered it necessary for them to stop, turned into a grove by the roadside, as they had no intention of going on to Savandrug that day, intending to halt some miles short of it, and to present themselves there the next afternoon. They therefore prepared for a stay of some hours. The pack-horses were unloaded and the saddles taken off the other animals. Half an hour later a party of twelve men, travelling in the same direction as themselves, also halted and turned in among the trees. The man who was apparently the leader of the party came across to where they were sitting. "'We do not disturb you, I hope, brothers,' he said. "'The grove is large enough for us all. I see that you are traders, like myself.' Oh, by no means, Surajah replied. The wood is open to all, and even were it not, we should be discourteous indeed, did we refuse to share our shade with others. Sit down by us, I beg of you, while your people are unloading your animals. I marked you as you left Bangalore, the trader said, as he seated himself beside them, and when I saw that you were taking the same route that we should follow, I wondered how far our roads might lie together. We are travelling west, Surajah replied. It may be that we shall stop at Magri and there, or at uh, Uthradrug, stop for a day or two to trade. Thence we may go north. Then as far as Uthradrug our paths will lie together, the merchant said. There we shall strike the river and turn south to Serengapatam. I am sorry that you will not be going farther in our direction, for the roads are far from safe. Since the war with the Ferengis ended, there are many disbanded soldiers who have taken to Dakoiti, and it is always better to travel with a strong band. I wonder that you venture with three loaded animals and only one man beside yourselves. Surajah was about to speak, but a quick glance from Dick stopped him. We think that there is less danger in travelling in a small body than there is with a large one, the latter said. There is less to tempt anyone to interfere with us. Moreover, we could not travel with a caravan, because the greater part of our goods are such as would tempt the peasantry only. We therefore stop at small villages to trade leaving the towns to those who travel with more valuable merchandise. After chatting for some minutes, the traveller got up and joined his party. "'I don't much like that fellow's looks,' Dick said when they were alone. "'Why? He looks a very respectable man.' "'Oh, yes, he looks respectable enough. But for all that I just don't fancy him. It may be that he regards us as rivals, and was only trying to find out where we intended to stop, and whether we were likely to spoil his trade.' That was why I said what I did, so that he might perceive that we were not likely to interfere with him. Then again, Surajah, I remembered my uncle's warning against joining other travellers, as these thugs, who they say commit so many murders, generally travel in bands disguised sometimes as traitors, sometimes as men seeking work, sometimes as disbanded soldiers. Anyhow, it is well to be careful. We have each got a brace of double-barrelled pistols in our girdles in addition to these old single-barrelled Indian ones that we carry for show, and our swords are leaning against the tree behind us, so we can get hold of them in a minute. I know, of course, that the betting is all in favour of these people being peaceful traders, but I don't want to leave anything to chance, and there is nothing like being prepared for whatever may happen. Presently Dick got up and sauntered across to Ibrahim, who was engaged in cooking. "'Ibrahim,' he said, "'don't look around while I speak to you, but go on with your cooking.' I don't like the look of the leader of this party. He may be a respectable trader. He may be a decoit or a thug. I want you to keep a sharp lookout without seeming to do so. See that your pistols will come out of your girdle easily. Keep your sword handy for use. If you see anything suspicious, come over and tell me. And if there is not time for that, shout. I will watch, Sahib, Ibrahim said. But they seem to me peaceful men like ourselves. Of course they carry weapons. No one would travel about with merchandise without doing so. 
They may be all right, Ibrahim, but I have a sort of feeling that they are not, and at any rate it's best to be cautious. The other party did not light a fire, but sat down and ate some provisions they carried with them. When Surajah and Dick had finished their meal, the leader again strolled over to them. He asked whether they intended to sleep, and on hearing that they did not, he again sat down with them. He proceeded to discuss trading matters, to describe the goods he carried, the places where he had purchased them, and the prices he had given. As he talked, Dick noticed that three or four of the others came across. They did not sit down, but stood round listening to the conversation, and sometimes joining in. Dick's feeling of uneasiness increased, and, thrusting one hand carelessly into his girdle, he grasped the butt of one of his hidden pistols. Suddenly a loud cry came from Ibrahim. At the same moment something passed before Dick's face. He threw himself backwards, drawing his pistol as he did so, and fired into the body of the man behind him. A second later he shot another, who was in the act of throwing a twisted handkerchief round Surajah's neck. Then he leapt to his feet, delivering as he did so a heavy blow with the barrel of his pistol on the head of the trader who had been sitting between him and Surajah. It had all passed in a few seconds, and the other men started back in their surprise at this unexpected failure of their plan. Surajah was on his feet almost as quickly as Dick. Even yet he did not understand what had happened. At this moment there was the crack of another pistol, and then Ibrahim came running toward them, having shot a man who had suddenly drawn his sword, and tried to cut him down. At his heels came the six men who had, up to this point, been standing in a group near their horses. Without hesitation Dick drew out one of his single-barreled pistols and shot the pretended traitor, whose turban had saved him from the effect of the blow, and who, shouting loudly to his companions, was struggling to his feet. The remaining eight men had all drawn their swords and were rushing upon them. "'Fire, Surajah!' Dick shouted. "'Are you asleep, man?' Surajah was not asleep, but he was confused by the suddenness of the fray, and was still doubtful whether Dick had not made an entirely unprovoked attack upon the strangers. However, he perceived that it was now too late to discuss that point, and was a question of fighting for his life. Accordingly, he fired both barrels of one of his pistols. One of the men dropped. "'Your sword, Surajah!' Dick exclaimed, as he grasped the scabbard of his own weapon in his left hand while in his right he held his other double-barreled pistol. Their antagonists, with yells of fury, were now upon them. Dick shot one, but the next man he aimed at darted suddenly aside when he fired. Dick dropped his pistol and grasped the hilt of his sword just in time to ward off a blow aimed at his head. Blow after blow was showered upon him so quickly that he could no more than ward them off and wait his opportunity. He heard Surajah fire two more shots in quick succession. Then Ibrahim suddenly dashed forward and cut down his opponent and then furiously engaged another, who was on the point of attacking him from behind. Dick drew his remaining pistol and shot the man through the head. He had then time to look around. Both Surajah's shots had told, and he was now defending himself against the assaults of two others, who were pressing him hard, while a third stood irresolute a short distance away. Dick rushed to Surajah's assistance. As he did so, the third man fled. "'After him, Ibrahim! Dick shouted. "'Not one of them must get away!' The two thugs defended themselves with cries of fanatical fury, but their opponents were far better swordsmen, and fighting coolly were not long before they cut them both down. "'What on earth is it all about, Dick?' Surajah asked, as, panting with his exertions, he looked round after cutting down his opponent. "'Thugs,' Dick said briefly. "'Are you sure, Dick?' Surajah asked presently. "'It may be a terrible business for us, if there is any mistake.' For answer, Dick pointed to the bodies of the two men he had first shot. One still grasped the rumal, or twisted silk sash, while a like deadly implement lay by the side of the other. "'Thank heaven!' Surajah ejaculated. "'I was afraid there might have been a mistake, Dick, but I see that you were right, and that it is a party of thugs. If it had not been that you were on watch for them and had your pistol ready, we should have lost our lives.' "'It was a close shave as it was, Surajah. One second later, and you and I should both have been strangled.' I had my hand on my pistol, and felt so sure that an attack was intended, that the moment something passed before my face, although I had no idea what it was, I threw myself back and fired at the man behind me, with an instinctive feeling that my life depended on my speed. But it was only when, on looking at you, I saw a man in the act of throwing a noose around your neck, that I knew exactly what I had escaped. "'It was fortunate that they had not pistols,' Surajah said. "'We should have had no chance against them if they had had firearms.' No, they could have shot us the moment I first fired, but Uncle said, when he was talking to me one day, that he had heard that the stranglers did not carry firearms, because the reports might attract attention, 
and that it was a matter of religion with them to kill their victims by strangling, but that if the strangler failed, which he very seldom did, the other men would then dispatch the victims with their swords and knives. Ah, here comes Ibrahim. I caught him just outside the trees, Sahib. He will strangle no more travellers. Well, what had we better do? asked Surijah. I should say we had better make off as fast as we can. Of course, if we were really traders able to prove who we are, we should go back to the town and report the affair, but as we can't do that, we had better be moving on at once before any other party of travellers comes up. That was why when we had killed several of them I was anxious that none should get away, for they might have gone and accused us of slaughtering their companions. Oh, that would be too unlikely a story to be believed. No one would credit that three men would attack twelve. But there would be no one to prove that there were only three. The fellows would naturally swear that there were a score of us, and that, after murdering their companions, the rest made off with the booty. Ibrahim, load the pack animals at once. We will saddle the horses. I think, Surajah, we had better leave everything just as it is. It's now getting on for afternoon. It's likely enough that no other travellers will enter the grove to-day. By to-morrow, at the latest, someone will come in, and will, of course, go and report at once in Bangalore what he has found, and they will send out here to examine into it. When they find that the men have all fallen sword in hand, that two of them are evidently stranglers, and that their girdles have not been searched, nor the packs on their horses opened, it will be seen that it was not the work of robbers. I don't suppose they will know what to make of it, but I should think that they would most likely conclude that these men have been attacked by some other party, and that it is a matter of some feud or private revenge, though even then the fact that the bodies have not been searched for valuables or the baggage or animals carried off will beat them altogether. By this time the horses were ready for the start, and after looking up and down the long, straight road to see that no one was in sight, they issued from the wood and continued their journey. Being anxious now to get away as far as possible from the scene of the struggle, instead of going on to Magri as they had intended, they turned off by the first country road on the left-hand side, and made for Savandrug, which they could see towering up above the plain. When within three miles of it they halted in a large wood. Here, as soon as the horses had been unsaddled and the fire lighted, their talk naturally turned to the fight they had gone through. "'I cannot make out how you came to suspect them, Dick.' "'I can hardly account for it myself, but, as I told you, I did not like the look of that man, and I had an uneasy sort of feeling, which I could not explain even to myself, that there was danger in the air.' "'But what made you think of those stranglers? I had heard some talk about them, but never anything for certain.' The Rajah told me, when he was warning me against joining parties of travellers, that although very little was known about the organization, it was certain that there was a sect who strangled and robbed travellers in great numbers. He said that he was aware that complaints had been made, to princes all over India, of numbers of persons being missing, and that it was certain that these murderers were not the work of ordinary dacoits, but of some secret association, and that even powerful princes were afraid to take any steps against it as one or two who had made efforts to investigate the affair had been found strangled in their beds. Therefore no one cared to take any steps to search into the matter. It was not known whether these stranglers, scattered as they were, very widely obeyed one common chief, or whether they acted separately. But all were glad to leave this mysterious organization alone, especially as they preyed only on travellers, and in no case meddled in any way with rajahs or officials who did not interfere with them. Consequently, the idea occurred to me directly that these men who seemed like traitors might be a party of these stranglers, and when the others came up, while the leader was sitting talking to us, I felt as if cold water was running down my back, and that someone was whispering to me, Be on your guard! Be on your guard! Therefore the moment something passed before my face I threw myself back and fired at the man behind me, without a moment's thought as to what it was. Well, certainly you saved our lives by doing so, Dick for I suppose if that man behind me had once got his silk scarf around my neck, he would have choked me before I had time to so much as lift my hand. I have not the least doubt that he would, and I feel thankful indeed that I had such a strange feeling that these men were dangerous. Do you know, Surajah, it seems to me that it was just the same sort of feeling that my mother tells me she has, whenever my father is in danger, and I shall be curious to know when we get back whether she had the same feeling about me. Anyhow, I shall in future have even more faith than I had before, in her confidence that she would have certainly known if any evil had happened to my father.' 